question three. Um, I think the question three was pretty good for this paper compared to the rest of the questions. It was pretty easy. Um, it's just there's no real trick, so you just read the information that they give you, and so you have a probability density function here. And t is minutes, and the variable is how many minutes she spends on her homework. Um, so you have a graph here, and you, you just have to draw the hybrid function. Uh, it's just a linear graph, so it's pretty easy. You can put it in your CAS as well, just to make sure you're drawing the right thing. But the axes can get a little annoying because um, it's a bit hard to see. But basically, yeah, it looks like uh, if this was a straight line <laughs> like that. Uh, the important part for this question is that this part or like sometimes you might miss this part because like uh well this part is the important part but make sure you don't miss this part because you have to draw the zero line here and here if you don't draw these two lines you will lose a mark because it's part of the function so just be careful that you make sure to draw the zero lines um part b is pretty easy you just integrate it from 55 to 25 dt um, you can put this function into your CAS as a hybrid function, uh, but if that's too complicated or you're not like comfortable with that method, you can put it in as two separate functions and then do uh, 55 to 40 for this part and then 40 to uh, 55 to, oh, sorry, 55 to 45 for here and then 45 to 25 with this function, but you should get 415. Um, I highly recommend learning how to use the hybrid function on your case because then you don't have to do it in separate parts. Um, this is just your normal given expansion. So if it's given its intersection of the two things over the second, the given part. So if something's less than 25 and it's also less than 55, if we draw a number line, then the intersection part ha is uh, this part. So it's probability that t is less than or equal to 25 on t is less than or equal to 55. And that's just, I uh, put that into your CAS. Again, easy if you have a hybrid function on your CAS because you don't have to do it in different sections, but you should get one on 41. So next part, find a such that the probability of t greater than a is 0 0.7. So if we rewrite this as an integral, if it's greater than a, that means a is the lower boundary. And the maximum it could be is 70, and then ft dt uh, equals 0 0.7. So for this part, it's very handy if you have your hybrid function, because then you don't have to do it separately. But if you don't, or like if you have your hybrid function, you could just put it into your guys, and you get 39.3649. But sometimes a hybrid function doesn't work and like it might give you an error or if you're not using it or something like that. But basically what you have to do is you have to find which um, part of the, like which domain that um, 0 0.7 area falls into. So you would integrate uh, this part from 20 to 45 and you would find that area. And I don't remember what it is now, but it's definitely less than 0 0.7. So you know that up to here, the area is less than 0 0.7. So you know that A has to be in here somewhere. Um, maybe I'll explain it a better way. So basically what we're saying is that from 70 here to A somewhere over here, the area from here to here is 0 0.7. So that means from here to A, the area has to be 0 0.3. So if you find this, if you integrate it from the total area here and it's greater than 0 0.3, then you know A is in this area here. Uh, or like if you integrate here and this area is less than 0 0.7, then you also know that A has to be in here because like the integration of A somewhere to 70 has to be 0 0.7. So if you're not using a hybrid function, just make sure you can figure out in which like domain region A is a function. I mean, A is A is in that region. So just test which area is less than or bigger than 0 0.7 or three. 
um, just always helps to look at the graph you drew because then you can like visualize uh, what the area would look like and it helps. But yeah, otherwise just um, put it as a hybrid function into your CAS and it will just do the work for you. So now we're moving on to binomial. Um, you can kind of tell because um, so now they're giving you the probability that she spends more than 50 minutes on her homework. And also it's like three of seven randomly chosen days and you have the independent thing. So you can tell that we're transitioning from like probability density functions to a binomial. So if it's more than three of seven randomly chosen days, so the probability that we want is x is greater than three, but Again, uh, like I said, the previous uh, exam that we did last week, if you have uh, equality, you want it to be, instead of like greater than, you want it to be greater than or equal to, just so it's easier and you don't like accidentally put three as your lower boundary, because that would be wrong. So this is equal to x is equal to or greater than four. Um, again, uh, this is only possible in binomial because like in continuous, you might have 3.1, 3.2, etc. But for binomial, we know it's either three days or four days. So you can like ignore the decimals in between. Uh, but yeah, this is just put this into your CAS, n equals seven and p equals eight on 25. And you should get a 0 0.1534. So this is a given situation. So they tell you that they want the probability she spends more than 50 uh, minutes on her homework and at least two of seven days, given that she spends it on at least one of the seven days. So if we rewrite that, it's x is greater than or equal to one, given it's greater than or equal to, sorry, greater than or equal to one, given that it's greater than or equal to one, on greater than or equal to one. And again, if you use your number line for the, Oh, sorry. So again, we have to rewrite this as x is greater than uh, equal to two or greater than equal to one. And then you divide it by x is greater than equal to one. So if you draw the number line for this part, um, the intersection, intersecting or common areas, common section would be x is greater than two, um, x is greater than one. You can just put that into your CAS. Again, n is seven and p is uh, eight on 25 and you get 0 0.7626. Again, uh, like I said last week, just be careful of the decimal points because like we're used to four, but if they give you three, you will lose marks unnecessarily. So we're still on binomial distribution and now they're changing the numbers or rather, <clears throat> sorry, they're getting rid of the numbers and they're giving us variables. So, the probability that x is greater than d is p, and q is the probability that out of two of seven days, um, that condition is true. So um, the information that we have right now is probability x is greater than d is p, and q is the probability that d is true for two or three days. So since this is binomial, two or three days means seven choose two, P two, one minus P five, um, or, and or, or is union, not intersection. And is intersection, but or is um, union. So if it's union, we can just add them. Um, seven choose three, P three, one minus P four. Um, you could just put that into your CAS. This, um, yeah, just it simplifies by itself. Um, I wrote it as like a giant uh, expanded form, but the answers have it in factorized form. You can do whichever way. I'm just going to write what I wrote. Plus 21p squared. And that's your polynomial. Um, yeah, and that's a good way of checking that you have the correct answer because oh, uh, like it's a polynomial. <laughs> so find the maximum value of Q. So that's kind of links to this question because you know with polynomials you can uh, you could like have stationary points. 
I just put uh, Q as a function of P into my CAS and I asked it to find F max. Um, and your domain of P and Q should be zero to one because they're both probability values. Um, and when you put that into your CAS, you should get 0 0.5665 and P is 0 0.3539. But if you don't have that function on your CAS, uh, you could either graph Q of P between the same domain or you could let Q of P equal zero and then solve for, <clears throat> solve for P uh, again in the same domain and then put that back into the function to find Q. But yeah, if you can find like the equivalent to F max on your calculator, that would probably be the easiest way. Uh, so now I was asking the value of G for, I mean D for which the maximum occurs to the nearest minute. This is kind of an odd question because it's asking you to go all the way back to, oh, I went too far, to this part of the question because this is where you find the probability that she spends a certain amount of time on a question. So, <clears throat> so it's asking find the probability that uh, x is greater than d is equal <laughs> so we know p so we'll just rewrite this part so probability x is greater than d equals p but we figured out p from part g so x is greater than d equals approximately 0 0.3539 and if you recall the probability function from the first part, that would be 70 to D. Again, because it's greater than D, D has to be the lower limit. And FT DT is approximately 0 0.3539. And you just put that into your CAS and it will solve that D is approximately 49 minutes. Again, really handy to know how to use hybrid functions on your CAS so you don't have to find which part of the domain D is in and then solve individually, but yeah. So yeah, just play around with your cats. So that's question three. Question four was, it started out pretty good and then it ended really badly. But so this is a functions type question. So the first part is just saying there's a matrix and it goes from two X to FX. So FX is this function. Um, and you just approach this question normally. So, or you could, you don't even have to write any working out for this question. You could just say, this has been translated one to the left of this function. So C is negative one, and this has been translated uh, one, two down. So D is negative two. Um, if you're comfortable with transformations, transformations, you could just do it like that. But if you get mixed up, I get mixed up. So I always write a calculation. Um, so I'm just expanding the matrix here and then you rearrange it to find our x dash y plus d and then y equals y dash minus d so you have the clean x and the clean y uh, so you can sub those into here so y dash minus d equals 2x dash minus c y dash equals 2x dash minus c plus d. And then we can compare this to our original function. So x dash minus c equals x plus one, but the x's are the same. It's just been written like that. So that means uh, negative c equals one. So c is negative one. And if we compare the, um, the y translation, d is just negative two. So find the rule and domain for the inverse of f. So f is y equals two x plus one minus two. And I like to write let f y equal x. You could write like swap x y or something. Just let the examiners know what you're doing. Um, so x equals two y plus one minus two. Um, just here, be careful with your handwriting. I have messy handwriting, so sometimes like the Y comes down here and it becomes linear for some reason. So just like be careful. Um, and if you rearrange that, 
rearrange that, you just get y equals ln log 2 x plus 2 minus 1. And even though, like, usually questions as previous years only ask for the inverse function, I think uh, in the new syllabus, they began to ask for rule and domain. So make sure you don't just write the inverse function. Make sure you write the domain, which is negative 2 to infinity. Um, and if you're a bit uh, unsure because of the inverse functions, you can just check um, this domain and check if it's the range of this graph, which it is. So all clear, that's the right answer. Um, find the area between the graphs of F and F inverse. Uh, so F inverse looks kind of like, uh, let's just draw it. It looks kind of like, oh no, actually, it's, I think it's on the next page. Yeah, okay, I'll draw that. So it looks like this. But if, so the area we want is this part. If we expand that, it looks like this, right? So, but we know that um, at these points, the like, so F inverse X equals FX equals X. So we know that when they meet, they meet on the line Y equals X. So if you draw the line Y equals X, you can kind of see that it goes right between the points and the, both the graphs. So the area here would be the same as the area here. So the total area would just be twice of either area. So that's helpful because if you put, so normally to find the function, you would just put like uh, F, I think inverse X is the top one. Yep, so F inverse X minus FX DX. And that's how you f would find the area. But a lot of times the CAS will not work for this or it will give you like a weird answer because uh, it gets a bit complicated. So what you do is you try to find the same area written as a different form. So using this property where y equals x goes through the intersection of both the graphs, you can rewrite the area as twice, uh, either the top area or the bottom area, it doesn't really matter, but make sure you put the corresponding function at the top. So like this is f inverse x and this is fx. So if you're gonna use f inverse x, because that's the top one, you do fx dx. But if you're using the bottom one, you have to switch around which um, function is on top because um, fx is lower than x for that particular region. Uh, yep. And the only other thing to do is make sure you know what the, the boundaries are. You can just let um, either function equal to x, but you'll get uh, zero and a negative one. So zero, negative one, zero, negative one. But yeah, I think in this case, actually putting uh, f inverse x minus fx dx might have worked, but it's a good like practice not to do that because it might get complicated later on. Uh, so these are the points of intersection. Um, I'll just write equals f inverse x minus x dx, which is also equal to um, x minus fx dx, but you should get the same area no matter what you do. Um, yeah, and if you have time at the end to double check your answers, you always have to do things in a different way, otherwise you'll end up with the same answer and you won't actually check your work. So I like to find different ways of doing the same question. So if you did this question this way with the first time, if you're checking it, maybe do it this way and this way, make sure all three answers give you the same thing and then you can be sure that your question, like your answer is correct. So this question is showing you F and F inverse and is asking you to find uh, the gradient at F and the gradient F at F inverse. Um, don't be tricked by knowing that they both go through Y equals X because just because they do that doesn't mean they have the same gradient at this point. So make sure you differentiate both of them and let X equals zero. And you can just do this on your CAS. And for the first one, you should get F dash zero equals two LN two. And for the second one, F inverse dash zero equals one on two LN two. Uh, yep, and that's it. 
So next question, find the function, I mean, find the value of k such that g k x equals fx. This is when the questions start to get like a bit hard to do. So g k x is 2e x minus 2 and fx equals 2x plus 1 minus 2. So you can just, for this question, you can just equate them. So 2e k. I did it again. <laughs> uh, minus 2 equals 2x plus 1 minus 2, and then these will cancel. Um, and if you know your exponential properties, 2x plus 1 is the same as 2x times 2, because like when you multiply them, these the exponents will add. So using that property, we can rewrite this as equals 2x times 2, and then the 2s will cancel. So now you're left with ex equals 2x and we want k so we make this kx equals log 2 to the power x but using the rule of pq equals q log ep we can take out this x so kx equals x ln 2 and then both the x's will cancel and you just get k is ln 2. So kind of a sneaky question. They just tested your exponential and log properties. <laughs> um, next question is just find the inverse of gx, gkx. So gkx, 2ekx minus 2. So let gky equal x. Um, x equals 2eky minus 2. And you could just rearrange that and you get gk inverse x equals 1 on k ln x plus 2 on 2. Um, transformation from g1 to gk. So you might get confused g1 because they never mentioned a g1 anywhere. But the like what you have to see is that they've just replaced k with 1. So this is kind of like a general function rule. So every time you have k, you replace it with a 1 to get g1. Oh, sorry, this is g inverse. G K is this one. So you replace, just write it here, K X minus two. So you replace the K with a one. So G one X equals two E X minus two. And G K X equals two E uh, K minus two, K X minus two. So just using your transformation knowledge, if x is going to kx, then it's been dilated by a factor of 1 on k from, uh, from the y-axis. Oops. Um, so g inverse k, uh, 1, g inverse 1 x is ln uh, x plus 2 on 2. Again, just replacing the k here with a 1. And then g inverse kx is 1 on k ln x plus 2 on 2. So uh, if it's going from 1 to 1 on k, then you can see it's been dilated by a factor of 1 on k from the y x, I mean, x axis. Um, with transformations, be careful what word you use here, because if it's from, then it's um, 1 on k and y-axis. So if you change, there's like three things you could change. You could be x in or x-axis. So if you change any one of them, your answer could be wrong. So just make sure you know which one you're using. So this is kind of the first place you could get stuck on this question. So it's saying that L1 and L2 are tangents at the origin um, of the GK graphs. And you want to find values of K for when the angle between L1 and L2 is 30. So the first thing you do is you have to find what the tangents are. So GKX equals 2EKX minus 2. And if you differentiate that, it's 2KE2X. And if you find the if you're trying to find the tangent at the origin, that means you need to know the um, gradient at the origin. So gk dash zero equals 2ke zero, which is just 2k. 
Um, so L1 is just 2KX. You don't have to worry about um, finding like y minus y1 equals mx minus x1 because this graph is going through the origin. So anytime a graph goes through the origin, like this one or this one, the c value is zero because c is just um, y equals mx plus c. C is the y-intercept. So if it's going through the origin, c is zero. So you can just write it as y equals mx. And we found m because m is gk dash of zero. So that's L1. So to find L2, gk inverse x is uh, one on k ln x plus two on two. So gk inverse uh, dash x is one on k x plus two. So gk, oh, gk inverse x inverse dash zero. So the gradient at zero is one on two k. So L2 is just one on two k x. So that's, I think that would be one mark <laughs> for this question and you've already done quite like a lot of things. So the next part of the question, you might get stuck because, so you have these two, L1, L2. So you have these two um, gradients and it's saying that the angle between them is 30. So you might think um, like, so you do, you know, m equals tan theta. So you might get theta, like you might do theta equals tan inverse m, and then just do like tan inverse of this one minus this one and equate it to 30 and put that into your CAS. But if you do that, it won't work. Um, uh, or it might give you decimals. I think I got decimals, but the question is asking for exact values. So if your CAS gives you decimals, and you can't find a way to turn it into exact values, that's probably a hint that you're doing something wrong. Uh, so the trick or hint to this question is to look at the gradients. So you have 2k and 1 on 2k. So let's just say, let's say um, this is L1 and this is L2. So the big graph is alpha and the small graph is beta. So 10 alpha equals 2k and 10 beta equals 1 on 2k. So this is kind of the trick to the question. So before when we were looking at here, we were thinking that any like any theta value, so you could have like 59 minus 19 degrees. We could have like 49 minus um, 19 degrees, or you could have like like 37 minus seven degrees. Any any two theta values would give you 30. That's what we were thinking before. But if you actually look at the gradients, um, 10 alpha has to be equal to one on 10. No, nope, other way, 10 beta has to be equal to one on 10 alpha. And if you remember your exact values table, there's only actually one angle that this, or there's two, but where this holds true, because 10 pi on six is one on root three, and 10 pi on three equals root three. So you can see that these two angles um, would be the only angles that fulfill this condition. So using that knowledge, we now have uh, one or one set of answers. So if L1 is gonna be greater than L2, that means it has to have the bigger angle. So um, M equals 10 alpha. And we know now that alpha is pi on three. So, and M is uh, a 2K equals 10 pi on three. So K is root three on two or um, yeah, so k is root three on two. Um, you could put the same thing into like L2, you could do m equals 10 beta, but you get the same answer. So where like beta is pi on six, you'll still get um, 
Route 3 on 2, but it's asking for values of K. Like, they wouldn't have given you an S if there weren't multiple answers. Um, yeah, they put it in brackets, but really it's telling you that there's probably multiple values. So to make sure you have all the answers, you check what could possibly be different. So that's usually like, could there be another angle where this is true or like, is something in the, like the diagram could be swapped around or something. Um, in this case, this is the, these are the only angles. If you think about it, like tan is like this. So there's no like, like, uh, like with sine and cos, you could maybe find like this little, like swap it around or something. But with tan, there's so it's probably not this fact that you can change, but actually the diagram which you can change. So once you have one answer. So, um, so K is a uh, positive real, that's the condition given to us. So that's why I assumed L1 was on top of L2, because if K is like three, then the gradient would be higher. So the graph would be more steep. So L1 would be on top of L2, but we have to consider what happens if K is less than one, in which case this, will, this gradient will be less than this gradient. So that means um, L2, uh, would be uh, greater than L1. So if that happens, then L2 is the one with the gradient of tan pi on three. So then one on two K equals root three. K is um, two on root three, which is two root three on six. Uh, two root three on three, sorry. <laughs> And is that, let me just check. I have my answer in a different form. One on root three, that should be right. But yeah, that's the kind of the trick to that question is, oh, sorry, it's the other way around. One equals K, two K root three, so K equals one on two root three, yep. So yeah, the trick to this question is just realizing oh, that the gradients are like A and one on A and realizing that there's only two theta values that that's possible for. If you don't pick that up, um, you probably get stuck on this question for a while. Um, so yeah, that's part H. So I was relatively easy. You just let the oh okay so <laughs> this one also had a bit of a trick you had to realize that it said one solution so if something has one solution that means um it's only touching and if it's touching then the tangents have to be equal at that point um so if you didn't if you didn't see this and you just let um gkx equal gk inverse x equal x or like something like that like the normal way we do it, you'd find that you get stuck. Because, uh, like, I'll just let, I'll use gkx for this. Minus 2 equals x. And if you rearrange it, you just get 1 on k, ln x plus 2 on 2. But, like, k doesn't really affect how many values of um, x you might get here. Because you can't, uh, even if you put this into your case, you can't um, get it in terms of, x equals k something, your cas will not work, or at least the white cas didn't for me, but yeah. So you realize that's not the way to do it. There has to be like a trick or something that you're missing and then maybe reread the question and you'll see only one solution. So again, if it's only one solution, it's touching it. And if it's touching it, that means the tangents are equal. And that's extremely helpful because we found the tangents in this question, h, 
So L1 equals 2kx and L2 equals 1 on 2kx. So if the tangents are equal, you can just, oh, sorry, it's not the tangents, it's the gradients that are equal. Uh, so yeah, so if it's like, like this, then the gradient at this point has to be equal. So, well, the tangents are this, but just based on what we know from the previous question, how we've got the tangents. So GKX equals 2K equals one on 2K. So you can just let 2K equal one on 2K. So 4K squared equals one, K equals plus or minus half. And just remember your condition from the previous part of the question here that k cannot be negative so your answer is k is negative uh, positive half so yep um if you got stuck on this question and you skipped to here like halfway through you could still get this right so yeah um yep that's it for that question and so i i this is where i got stuck for the majority of my exam <laughs> Uh, so it's saying that there's an area between these two graphs um, and k is greater than p. So p from here, uh, p k is greater than half. And it's asking the smallest value of b so that the area is always less than b. So that's this part in itself is already confusing. This is not actually asking for the smallest value of anything. It's asking for the maximum value of AK. So I'll just draw it. So GK we know from previous questions is 2EKX minus 2 and G uh, inverse KX is 1 on K, ln X plus 2 on 2. So if I just draw GKX, this one, we have an asymptote that y equals negative two and probably looks something like, I'll just find the x-intercept. So ekx equals one, so that means x is zero. So that's important. So gkx equals zero. So this is finding the x-intercept. If you do that, you get two ekx minus two equals zero, ekx equals one. So if you do ln one equals kx, x is always zero. So no matter the value of k, the graph of gkx has to have an x-intercept at zero. Um, yep, yeah, so it'll look like this gkx. This is always zero, it's not dependent on k. Um, and then the next graph, uh, which is g uh, inverse k, you don't have to graph this, you can just use your reflection on y equals x, so it looks something like uh, negative two, so like this. Um, yeah, so that's extremely important that you like draw a small diagram or something because that will help you figure out what the question's asking. So if you look at here, state the smallest value of b such that a of k is less than b. So a of k is this part. So the smallest value of b so that this part is guaranteed less than b is asking what's the maximum possible value of this area so that no matter what the value of k is, it like will always be less than b. So really it's asking what's a k max. A k max. So to find a k max, like um, if you look at the graph, to find a k max, you have to figure out what happens when k increases or decreases or like what's happening there. And you have to find out what the graph looks like when um, like uh, when the, the area is the maximum possible it could be. So if the area is to be a maximum, you can tell that this point has to be as far back as it can be. Like, so compare this area to 
this area. Oops. So you can tell like when the point of intersection here gets bigger or negatively bigger, the area increases. But you can see from this um, asymptote here that the maximum it could be is actually negative two. So it will never be negative two, but the maximum it could be is negative two. So now you have your terminal. So the um, zero was important because, um, uh, yeah, so again, because GKX always has an intercept at zero and so does G inverse KX, I'll just show you. So let, we're finding the um, x-intercept of inverse of g kx. So 0 equals 1 on k, ln k plus 2 on 2. Again, you can get rid of k, so you know the x-intercept of both of these functions is not dependent on k. Um, so e to the power 0 equals x plus 2 on 2. 2 equals x plus 2, so x equals 0. So you know that both of these functions have a fixed x-intercept at 0, 0. That means one of the points of intersection is guaranteed to be at 0, 0. So if you're writing the integral and you know that this point is less than 0, so the upper boundary will always be 0. And from um, the asymptote, we can tell that the maximum lower boundary will be negative 2. So like if you figure out the boundaries, um, that's your like halfway there. And then it's just your normal uh, integration knowledge, like what do you do to find the area? Um, just like in the other question, uh, the area question, which was here, like um, this is important because now you don't wanna use uh, F dash inverse, F inverse X minus FX, cause that will get complicated for the part down below. You want to use one of these two equations. Uh, doesn't matter which one you used. I used this one for the part below. So I said the area is now equal to twice of, if you imagine y equals x. So it equals, oh, I'll just draw that in a different color. Didn't really help, but <laughs> y equals x. So area is twice the area that is uh, x minus g of x, g k x dx. So you're like almost there with this question. You have the integral. Now all you have to do is solve it to find the maximum value um, of a k, which is b. So the next thing you have to do is you have to use a bit of limits. So if, um, if, how to say, if, if K is greater than P, like, that means it's going on forever, right? So, cause you're trying to find the maximum area. So you are going to take the biggest possible values of everything. So if K goes to infinity, then GKX here, which is this one, if k goes to infinity and you draw your graph of ekx again, so y equals negative two. Uh, if k goes to infinity, so like you're saying this is two e negative infinity, I mean, infinity minus two, uh, this function will go to zero if that makes sense. <laughs> Maybe I'll do it, um, I'll do it the other way. Oh, I just rub this out, 2kx minus two. So inverse graph is here, this one. So, oh yeah, no, no, sorry, wrong graph. I was talking about the wrong graph. I'll uh, just, this is what I did. That's why it was making sense. I did it um, this way. So G inverse K of X DX, which is one on K ln X plus two on two. So if K goes to infinity, 
this part of the function will be one on infinity, which we know is zero. So if this part is zero, then the whole thing is zero. And that's the other half of this question. So now, because we're like doing limits, it'll never actually be zero, but because it's an inequality, we don't have to get like the actual maximum. We can use the theoretical maximum or that's probably incorrect lingo, but <laughs> I'm just gonna call it the theoretical maximum. So theoretically at the highest possible value of K, this function, uh, this um, uh, value would be zero. So now you're left with two zero to negative two, negative x dx. And you can just uh, integrate that. So you just get um, a equals two, negative two, x squared on two, zero to negative two. Area equals zero minus four on two, which is four. And four is the answer. So that's how you do that question. But the important part is getting this integral uh, and then figuring out that this part goes to zero. Uh, yeah, I hope that made sense. X is under like y equals x, it's this one, not this one. So in this case, area would be zero to negative two x minus two kx. Oh, I'm missing an e. Dx. So in this case, um, yeah. If I think x, so k goes to infinity, but um, x also goes to infinity. Uh, how do I explain this? So, okay, well, I'll just write zero to negative two k minus two plus two dx. Oh, I lost my thing. So you take k goes to, or you, you can start with k is like half. I think you could graph this on your calculator, this graph. And then if you keep increasing k, you'll see that it like uh, this 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 shape of this graph bends towards this asymptote. Oh, sorry, not this whole thing, just here. It bends towards the asymptote. So when it bends towards the asymptote, like this term and this term cancel out, and that's how you get zero. So if you're like, if you drew your graph and you're still confused, you can put it into your has and just check what happens when you increase k again using that uh, dynamic graph function on the white curves it's when you click on the little diamond uh, for the black curves i'm sorry i'm not sure if you guys can put variables into your curves, but yeah just draw the diagram and it should help otherwise the question might not make sense i took like half an hour on this question which is not a good amount of time, <laughs> but yeah. So that's question four. Uh, the next question is question two. So question two is the trig question, I think, yep. Uh, so you have a Ferris wheel and you have your graph of, I mean, you have your equation h of t. Um, it's important to note that t is minutes and h is meters. So make sure you don't think that like this point is not th. I mean, it is, but um, t is not like x values. t is not how far it is from the middle of the platform. t is time. So this is not, this is not a position equation. That's important later on. Just uh, note that, like take a mental note of it or something. Uh, max and min, it's a trig function. So max is just when this is negative one in this case, and min is when it's positive one. So min is 10 and the max is 
one, oops, 120, I think. So how much time is Tenny semi in the capsule? So that would be one period, um, because he only goes for one rotation. So that would be one period. So period is two pi divided by pi on 15, which is two times 15, which is 30. So that's 30 minutes. It's fine, rate of change. <clears throat> Sorry, one second. <laughs> So find the rate of change with respect to T and state the value of T at which the rate of change of H is a maximum. So uh, rate of change of H is with respect to T is just H dash T. You can do this by hand or by CAS, doesn't really matter, just as long as you end up with this. Um, so state the value of T at which the rate of change of H is at its maximum. Um, so this is kind of asking what's when is h of t at the max. So usually you have when's h of t at a max and you find h dash of t and you equate it to zero. But in this case, it's asking you for this one. Um, I don't recommend differentiating it again and equating it to zero because uh, sometimes the answers get like weird. Instead, um, I recommend graphing this so you get like something that looks like this and then finding the maximum value of that. Uh, so if you graph this, in this case, you get T is exactly 7.5 minutes. So that's how you do that question. So if it's asking when the rate of change is at a max, then graph rate of change. But if it's asking when H is at a max, then you can differentiate it and equate it to zero. But I really, don't recommend doing h dash dash t equals zero because sometimes you get weird answers and they're wrong. And also it's like, it'll give you the stationary points. So don't, this answer would be wrong as well. So just don't, don't recommend doing this. You can if you want to, but it just gets complicated. Um, so now I was asking what's theta at this point here. So C, so we know the maximum, the height, the maximum height from, I think the very first part of the question. Uh, here, the maximum height is 120 and the minimum height is 10. So if you do like 120 plus 10 divided by two, this uh, height is 65, but you can also tell it's 65 if you look at um, the uh, function of time and height. Uh, so to find theta, we can just use uh, trig knowledge. So tan theta is opposite over adjacent. So theta is just tan inverse. 65 on 500, which is approximately 7.41 degrees. Again, be careful of the decimal places, but that's it for this question. Um, this part of the question is actually when it becomes important to remember that this is not um, a position function. This is a time and height function. So we can't get this x position like this. We can't get this distance using that function. They actually give that function to us here. So dy dx this is easy. You just use your chain rule. One on two, three or two, five minus x squared times negative two x and the twos cancel and you just get negative x on three to five x squared. That's it for that question. Um, now it gets a bit, uh, not this question, this question gets a bit tricky. So find the gradient of the line B to B, I mean P to B, terms of U, and hence find the coordinates of P2. So this is now a position, and we have a position function, this one. So we could rewrite this as U and 3025 minus U squared. So you can just chuck u in there to get um, v plus 65. Sorry, don't forget the plus 65. <laughs> so to find the gradient of the line segment, so we know b is 500, 0. You can just do m, uh, m equals y2 minus y1 on x2 minus x1. 
So why you can choose either point, but make sure um, your answer is negative because you can see the slope is going down this way, not this way, so it's negative. Um, I chose the higher point just because it was easier. So 325 minus u squared plus 65 on u minus 500. And you can tell this is going to be negative because u is less than 500. So this will be negative. Uh, so that's one thing you know. And oh, let me just see what I did. So I let this equal one. All right. And the second thing you know is the function for this. So y equals square root 3 or 2, 5 minus x squared plus 65. So this gradient that we calculated here has to be um, equal to like this point at the dy dx of this. dy dx is actually the answer to this question. So that's uh, helpful. So uh, the second thing we know is dy dx at p2 is minus u 3025 minus u squared. And you can just let one equal two onto your cares. And your cares will solve u for you. You get like a 12.997, but it's asking for two decimal places. So you have to round it to 13.00. And you can put that back uh, into your y function to find v. So v is 118.44. Uh, important part of this question is don't forget the 65. Um, I almost messed up there, but yeah, don't forget the 65. So find alpha. Um, same thing as before, so alpha is alpha is oh sorry, actually you have to do this a uh, different way. So these two questions are linked, or well, kind of linked, but so <laughs> see if I can explain this correctly. So alpha is the angle from here to here. Right, so how do I say this? Um, like uh, when you calculate, okay, I'll just write, uh, like uh, I'll just let, I'll let this equal beta. So when you do tan beta, Tan beta is actually the angle that gives you um, uh, you like tan beta is the one that gives you opposite on adjacent. I hope this is making sense, but yeah, so tan beta is the one that gives you opposite over adjacent, not tan alpha. So tan beta is um, so V, V on 500 minus U. Make sure you don't use just 500 because like this, this gap is missing. So it's not just 500. So beta is 10 inverse of uh, 11844, which is from here, but I would recommend using all the decimals again. 500 minus U, which is 12.997. And you get beta is, that's where you get beta, but um, alpha is actually 180 minus that value. So if you thought, um, if you thought like doing tan inverse would give you alpha, you would get a number that's bigger than 90. Um, and that's kind of your cue to realize that you actually found like this angle, not this one. So if you ever get an angle that seems wrong, just based on the diagram, make sure you check. And yeah, so in this case, this whole thing is 180. So you do alpha is 180 minus beta. So that's approximately 13.67. Um, that's also like the same kind of uh, trick, I guess, that you might have with part H. So it's asking to find the length of time during which the boat uh, at B is visible. So so from this question, it's, uh, what am I saying? Um, so tan beta 
Okay, I'll, I'll just explain what I said. So, so, like, think about your quadrant. So, tan, positive, negative, positive, negative. So, in this, like, uh, question, it's either one of these. But when you use your, like, triangle to find tan theta, you're kind of, like, saying that it's in the positive quadrant. So, that's why you have to do 180 minus that to get it into uh, this quadrant. So, like alpha minus alpha that's why you take this angle and not this angle because uh, tan theta is negative as you can see from the slope so you can't use your angle the positive version like uh, you can't use your angle that you calculated using a positive slope because the slope is negative so you have to find the same angle in um and uh, like a uh, so next question so asking for the length of time to the nearest minute during which the boat is visible. So if you go back to the previous question, um, it's first visible here. And then if you read the text for this question, which is like reading time, do that in reading time, it's no longer visible at P2. So the range of like the motion for which P, uh, for which the boat is visible is from P1 here to P2. So the question is asking essentially, how long does it take to get from P1 to P2? Uh, P1. So um, like what you can kind of see from this diagram is that the time it would take to get from P1 to P2 would be like a fraction of the time it takes to get from here to here. And we know that's half of the period, so 15 minutes. So basically what we're trying to find is like this angle here, because then we can do that angle over 180 is the time it takes over 15 minutes. So that's like what you should kind of see in order to get the answer for this question. Um, so after you kind of realize how to do the question, you have to actually do it. So to find the difference in angles, again, this is gonna be a bit confusing, but so your angle here, um, this one, so like how to say, so we want, so to find this angle, uh, this one, this angle here, we have to do this angle, this whole thing, I'll just draw it. We have to do this angle minus, um, oh, that's alpha. Well, I'll just call it like angle one minus, the B P one angle, so this angle, angle two, so we can get this like difference. We have to do these two angles, but we don't actually know those two angles yet. Cause what we know is this angle and this angle. So the first angle we're trying to find is, oh, I'll just, rub some of this out so it's easier to see but the first angle we're trying to find is this entire angle so not not alpha but we're trying to find this entire angle so the way we do that is you can see here that if you draw uh, if you extend this triangle here you have like a triangle that looks like this and you also can see this little triangle here that looks like this. So this is similar triangles, but in a, in a random trig question, there's similar triangles. So <laughs> what you have to see here is that this angle that we calculated as alpha is um, actually this tiny angle here. That's also alpha. So that's helpful because now we know that this giant angle here that we want 
angle one is actually 180 minus alpha. So similar triangles, we have our first angle. And then the next angle we need is this angle here, which is not as hard to get because you don't need similar triangles. You can just say total um, like degrees in a triangle is 180. I mean, yeah, 180. So if we need this angle, angle two, we know this is 90, so it's minus 90. Angle two is 180 minus 90 minus theta. So it's 90 minus theta, and that's like, oh, I didn't do it like separately, so I'll just calculate it now. Theta is, it's theta. Theta is 7.41. Oh, okay, well, we don't need that, but like just store that uh, value in your case. It's like 172.59 something. Uh, and this one is, oh, no, no, no. Sorry, this is 82 point. This is 82.59 and this is 180 minus 13.67. This is 160, the gray angle is 166.33. Uh, so now we have our two angles. So we have this big angle that we got from minusing alpha, which is 166.33. And we got this smaller angle we got from minusing uh, theta, which was 82.59-ish. So the difference between the angles this much would be just these two values minus each other. So that is 60, I'll just write in the working out space. So difference in angles is 83.74. Um, um, I would recommend using all the decimals in the previous questions, because I'm pretty sure you get like 83. 736 or something like that, but just because, you know, more precision, more decimal points. But in this case, it also doesn't really matter because it's asking to the nearest minute, but good habits. So, yes, yeah, the difference in angles is 83.74. And then from that fraction, we were going to use uh, 83.74 on 180 equals the time we want on 15 minutes. So, if you solve for that, you get 6.9 seven, eight minutes, and it's to the nearest minute, so that's why it's seven minutes. So yeah, that's that question. So basically just be careful about your angles, know which one you're trying to find. If your answer looks wrong, like double check it, make sure you know what's going on. Uh, yep, yeah, so that's question two, I think. Yeah, so last question is question one. Uh, question one's pretty simple. It's just your normal calculus functions and stuff. So find the coordinates of the turning points. Just let f dash x equal to zero. Um, put that into your CAS. You should get plus minus 15 on three, plus minus 10 root 15 on nine. Um, find the equation of a straight line through a and b. Um, A is like oh, here and B is here. Um, so if you put in like to actually find the coordinates, you get A is negative one four and B is one negative four. Um, and M is using like y two minus y one is four plus four or negative one minus one, which is negative four. And you can use your y minus y1 equals m x minus x1. Uh, x minus 4 equals minus 4 x plus 1. And if you simplify that, the c term is actually 0. y equals negative 4 x. And you can kind of see that because, like, if you draw your graph, you can see it's going through the origin. So you know your answer is correct. Find a, b. So distance a, b is just uh, like y2 minus y1 squared plus x2 minus x1. 
square and you just put your two coordinates into here and you should get two root 17. Yep, that's that question. Uh, so find CD in terms of K, oh, the distance, sorry. So uh, easier to find your coordinates first, just so you know like what you're dealing with and then one minus K. So CD is using the same equation, K minus one minus one plus K squared plus one plus uh, one squared, I guess, cause it's one minus minus one. You can just put this into your case to simplify it and it gives you K squared minus two K plus two units. Um, I like to write units cause it's asking you for a distance. So technically there could be a value, but yeah. I don't think they penalized you in this exam for not writing units, but uh, good habits. <laughs> so find the value of K such as the distance CD is equal to K plus one. You can just let this equal to K plus one. Um, your CAS will give you K is equal to one or K is seven on three. Usually you would check to make sure that like are uh, the restrictions on K, do they both fit? But in this case, it's asking you for values. So um, you know that both your values will work, but again, just be careful. In this case, K is an element of the positive reals, but that doesn't really knock out any of your answers. So it's all fine. So find the value of A in terms of K. So A is when these two graphs intersect. So you can let x equal k3 minus, I mean, x about 3 equal minus kx. Cas x equals 0 or x equals plus minus k plus 1. But you can see from the graph that a is greater than 0, so a is k plus 1. Uh, find the area of the shade, rated, shaded region. <laughs> Sorry, so area is just from where they meet, so a to 0, and the top function is x, so x is on top and minus gx and a we know is uh, square root k plus one zero x minus gx dx and if you put this into your cas with k as any variable i like to use y because um the cas has less chance of mucking up if it's y uh yeah you just solve for that on your cas and you should get uh area is k plus one squared on four, it might give you a really weird answer the first time, but if you press simplify, it should uh, look nicer. So just uh, get into the habit of pressing simplify if your answer looks weird, because you get an easier looking answer. Um, yep, and that's question one.